The topic of this week is probability. I'll be showing how integration is important and useful in the study of probability. To do so, I need to talk about the two different kinds of probability that mathematics deals with. The first is discrete probability. This is a situation where there are only finitely many measurements. For flipping a coin, there are only two outcomes. For rolling a six-sided die, there are six outcomes. There are a set number of outcomes and each can be signed a probability. For a fair coin, the probability of heads or tails are both 50%. For a well-made six-sided die, the probability of any roll, one to six, is approximately 16.7%. If you roll two six-sided dice, then the probability of getting a seven is much higher than getting a two, since there are six combinations that give seven and only one combination, both ones, that produces a two. Discrete probability works by assigning these percentages to each of the measurements. All of the probabilities have to add up to 100%, which we usually just write as one, treating 50% say as one half and similar for other percents. Discrete probability, at least at the introductory level, doesn't really need calculus at all. Most of the main ideas can be defined just with sums and algebra. This expression, that all the probabilities add up to one, is just a finite sum. No calculus is required. Some measurements, however, are better suited to continuous probability. Unlike discrete probability, continuous probability allows for a whole real number range of measurements. A standard example is the height of members of a population. In a large population, the heights will vary in a range. Mathematically, it makes sense to consider this range as an interval in the real number line, all possibilities between a minimum and maximum height. In this way, there are now infinitely many measurements. Any real number in the range could be a measurement. Probability is now assigned to this whole range of measurements, not to just a specific instance. I don't ask what the probability of the height of a tree, say, is being exactly six meters. Instead, I ask for the probability of a height being between, say, six and seven meters. I ask for a range, a piece of the real number line, an interval. For a discrete probability, each measurement was assigned a probability and the probabilities added up to one. For continuous probability, this system doesn't work. Instead, there is a function that captures the probability. The domain of the function is the measurement interval a to b. The output of the function must be positive since negative probability doesn't, doesn't make sense. In this sense, the function does assign a pro probability to each measurement. It assigns to each measurement x the value f of x of the function. However, there are infinitely many measurements, infinitely many inputs, so I can't just add up the probabilities and get one. Instead, the integral of the function over the probability space must be one. As I go from finally many to infinitely many measurements, the sum becomes an integral. This function is called a probability density function or a probability distribution. I'll mostly refer to these functions simply as distribution throughout the videos this week. So I have a range of measurements and a distribution f such that the integral of f over that range of measurements is one. How does this capture probability? This isn't quite as straightforward as the discrete system, where I can easily say, for example, that rolling seven on two dice is more likely than rolling two. How does this function determine the probability situation? Well, let me talk through the details of the distribution to try to answer this. First, the measurement is the input, the independent variable. This is already a bit of an adjustment. If I am talking about height, with a function, usually height is the output. Here, the height is input, and the output, f of x, is related to the probability of that height. So the output is a probability, sort of, but not for individual measurements. A specific height, say exactly six meters, is actually impossible. Instead, probability only makes sense for a range of heights. How is that determined? Well, by the interval. If x is not x1 is a range of heights inside the total possible range of heights a to b, then the probability of finding a measurement between x0 and x1 is the integral of the distribution between x0 and x1. 
So the function measures probability, but only via its integral. The probability integral over the whole domain is 1, so the integral over a subset of the domain will be some number between 0 and 1, which is exactly what probabilities should be, and which we could interpret as percent if we wish. With this setup, there is a function for continuous probability, but without integration the function doesn't do anything. Everything about the probability of the situation is determined by some integral of the distribution. Finally, note that f of x can have tall spikes, much higher than the value of 1. It's only the area under the curve that has to be 1, but the function itself could be very tall and narrow and still have area 1. Let me get to some examples. I have three examples in this video, and they are all central examples in the theory and useful for various kinds of data. The first is the exponential distribution, f of x equals alpha e to the negative alpha x, where alpha is a positive parameter and the domain is from zero to infinity. This domain is well suited to measurements that don't have a clear maximum. The probability of a very large measurement will be low, since this function is exponential decay, but it allows for arbitrarily large measurements. First, let me check that this is a distribution by checking the integral condition. This is an improper integral, so I set it up as a limit as a goes to infinity. The antiderivative is e to the negative alpha x divided by negative alpha, which I evaluate on the bounds and take the limit, and the result is indeed 1. I needed to have the alpha out front to make this happen. Often distributions will include some constant out in front to make sure that the integral of the distribution over the whole space will evaluate to 1, which is necessary for it to be probability. So what does the exponential distribution measure in terms of probability? Well, here's a graph of this exponential function. It is a decay function, so it suits a situation where lower measurements are quite probable and higher measurements become unlikely. Things like wealth and income often have this profile. There are many people with low to medium wealth or income, and only a very few cases with extreme measurements. The area under the graph between various pieces gives the probability of measurements in those pieces. The area between 0 and 1 is about 0 0.632, so the probability of a measurement between 0 and 1 is about 63.2%. The area between 1 and 2 is about 0 0.233, so the probability of a measurement between 1 and 2 is about 23.3%. And I could go on, calculating the smaller and smaller probabilities of this distribution. The key is, though, that these are all integrals. The area under the curve is the probability, so it is all measured by integration. The next example is perhaps the most common and most important probability distribution, the Gaussian distribution, otherwise known as the bell curve. The full version is here, with two parameters, sigma and mu. I'm going to talk about those parameters in later videos. For now, let me choose some specific values. I'll choose sigma to be 1 over root 2 and mu to be 0, and this is the resulting function, one particular case of the bell curve. The domain in general is all real numbers. The bell curve, at least in full generality, allows for any measurements. Is this a probability distribution? Does it have area 1 under the curve? It does, but I can't give the proof right now. The value of the integral of e to the negative x squared over all real numbers is the square root of pi, which is a very strange result. Therefore, by dividing this square root of pi, I can make sure that the area is 1, so this is a distribution. In the full general form, dividing by sigma times the square root of 2 pi will again always ensure that the total integral is 1 over all real numbers. Here is the picture of the bell curve. For the choice I made, this is centered at zero, but it could be centered elsewhere. It measures a situation where there are likely measurements near some peak, and they decay at equal rates on either side. Many measurements often fit bell curves, heights or other demographics and population, skills and perform performance metrics in a large population, the continuous version of dice rolls with multiple dice, and so on. Most measurements for these distributions will be near the center, and very few measurements will be far out from the middle of the bell curve. And again, the key idea is that any measurement of probability is going to be a portion of the area under this curve. Finally, an important, if simple, distribution is the uniform distribution. This is a function which is constant on an interval a to b and 0 elsewhere. 
This is a distribution that says that a measurement can fall anywhere between A and B, and the probability is entirely equal at all points between A and B, hence uniform. The 1 over B minus A is again set up to make sure that the integral over the domain is 1. The graph of this is a rectangle of height 1 over b minus a and width b minus a, so the area, height times width, is in, in fact 1. Subsections of this rectangle will again give the probability of measurements for pieces of the interval. And this is a useful baseline distribution to understand the situation where all measurements are exactly equally likely.